Welcome, welcome. This is the Enlightenment Show, and I'm your host, Laurie Schoenfeld. Our guest today is Charlie Pulsper, author of The Crystal Bridge and a master cardboard extraordinaire. We're going to be chatting with him today all about his cardboard creations and what mysterious places he's explored that's inspired creativity. Welcome, Charlie. So glad to have you here. Thank you. Glad to be here. <laughs> what is something playful that's going on within your life right now? Playful. Um, that's interesting. I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> I've, I've gotten into, I, I recently discovered the new AI program that uh, you put in prompts and it, it creates art. Ooh. And so I've been exploring that as a, kind of a jump starter for um, some of my characters, what they look like and things like that. And also to think about new book covers and, and things like that. So I've been messing around with that. Um, I recently went camping in my teardrop trailer for the first time in a while since I've taken that out. Yes. And uh, so those are a couple of fun things that are going on in my life. That's super playful. And with your camper, I'm sure you've had quite a few adventures that you've explored on your own with that journey there. I have. I lived in it for about six months a few years ago and uh, traveled all across the country, went from uh, the bottom of California up all the way to Seattle and then across the whole country and from Maine all the way to Florida and then all the way back to Utah. Mm. And so I got to see about 80% um, of the states on that trip. And I've been to most of them besides that. I think there's only two that I haven't been to now. <laughs> and, uh, and so I need to kind of visit a couple one of them, Alaska. I haven't ever been to Alaska, but yeah. I remember you posting about your journey and a little part of my heart. I was right there with you going, this has got to be one of the most expansive, like healing, creative journeys I can imagine. Because I definitely also would love to just go and just be in the moment of wherever you just end up in. What did you learn about yourself the most when you went on that journey? Uh, I learned a lot. I was kind of, it was one of those trips where it was like, I was hoping it was going to be like eat, pray, love, and you find mm -hmm. yourself and you find exactly where you're supposed to be. And um, some of those things happened and some of them didn't. Like I, mm -hmm. I didn't find exactly where I, like I expected to like land in a location and be like, this is where I'm supposed to be for the rest of my life and and nothing like that clicked and happened but i did go through a lot of really highs and lows where i was experiencing these amazing places that that i've always wanted to visit um had some almost spiritual experiences in uh the redwoods and at niagara and um at a little campsite in the middle of nowhere up by Mount Rushmore. And then I also had some really, really dark lows where I was like stuck in the trailer for mm. a week at a time while it was sleeting and raining and cold and miserable and just felt lonelier than I've ever been in my life too, because I had no, like I was in the badlands at one point and I had no cell phone connection and it was freezing and it mm. was cold and miserable and and just sat in the trailer with myself and my own thoughts for days on end. And um, which is also good for you. I, I recommend everybody does that a little <laughs> bit, that they have those moments where they just feel completely alone and stuck with themselves because you learn a lot about yourself. Um, I, I am very proud of myself for doing it and making it through it and it like I look back on the whole trip as a whole now and I'm like I did that 
and it was really a lot and scary and big and I did it. And so that, that helps you kind of tackle other big things in your life. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of you too, friend, because definitely <laughs> sitting with your thoughts. I like to think of it like multiple times that I've been in the cocooning stage is what I like to call it. Like you're sitting in that spot where you know you need to be, but you don't want to be there. And it's supposed to be good in healing, but it doesn't feel like it when you're in it. Like it in the moment, you're like, this is not, this is not okay. No, like, it doesn't going into a dark cave, you just don't know what you're going to see or get. And it can be scary and dark and lonely. And so high five, Charlie, because wow. Yeah. I think a lot of people understand more of what it was like now that COVID hit and mm. people got stuck at home for days on end, weeks, months on end, and yeah. uh, had to kind of sit with themselves and um, work their way through some like deep set traumas and depressions and things and and find out who they really are. And I got to do that in a microcosm of traveling across the country by myself. And I think it, I think it's good for us. It doesn't really doesn't feel like it, but it is. <laughs> the whole being with yourself is such an art, wouldn't you say? It is. And like, sometimes you find things about yourself you don't like, and it helps you like improve and change and, and say, okay, I do need to be a little stronger and stand up for myself. I do need to set some boundaries with people. And, and it really does help to face that darkness within a little bit. Yeah. So you, there's so many things about you, Charlie, that I absolutely love. I love that you are so creative and hilarious and one of the most genuine humans that I know. The art that you create out of cardboard, I will have to say, I'm always awestruck by how you put it together and what's the whole process of how you go about doing that. When did you begin starting on this journey it's been about five years i think now mm. that i since i started cardboard <clears throat> and it all came about partly because of my day job i i work in marketing and i was working at a company that did vegan protein and they were changing their packaging and as i was writing a video script about them changing their packaging um, we talked a lot about cardboard and the recyclability of cardboard and things like that in the script. And I, I kept thinking, okay, we need to do this video out of cardboard. And I brought that to the owners and said, this is what I'm thinking. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> and they were like, that sounds like you're just going to put trash in front of our audience. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no, you're not seeing it. And so I went home and I made a tractor out of corrugated cardboard. Um, that was about yay big and brought it in the next day, rolled it across the table to them. And they were like, yeah, let's do this. Th this is cool. And so I made all the props and we did puppetry and, and like I did a background set and all these things out of cardboard that was not very big. And, but as I was making all those props, I kept thinking I could go smaller. I could really go really small with cardboard and, and play around with this. And so as soon as we were done filming, I went home and I made my very first dragon and it's still one of my favorite pieces. And it is the first time, like I've always wanted to be an artist ever since I was a little kid. I started with crayons and was drawing uh, dinosaurs when I was four, five, and I kept doing that into high school and I was doing uh, pen and ink a lot, but nev never did my art come out how it is in my head. It was never mm -hmm. quite right. And this dragon was the very first time that that clicked, that it was exactly how I imagined it. It came out in real life and I realized I should have been sculpting in 3D 
my whole life instead of trying to do pen and ink and trying to do 2D art because I'm not as good at it. And um, so once that, that dragon clicked, I started making more and I went smaller and I tried different forms and different ideas. And so far, every piece that I've done has turned out exactly how I want it to. And so I'm, I've been very happy with my cardboard art. Was the tractor the first project that you did? It was. Okay. And how many have you created? What are a few? So you have the tractor and dragon. What are a few others you've created? I've got, um, I've done about five different dragons. Uh, some of them more realistic, some of them more um, like mechanical looking. And then I've done a whole set of tiny fairy houses. I've done little tiny, tiny, tiny two inch tall houses out of the cardboard. And those are some of the pieces that I've, I've managed to sell. Like I've, I've sold several of those and um, because people fall in love with these little tiny fairy houses with little drawbridges and little swing sets and things hanging off of flower stems and they're they're very tiny and intricate and so those do well um i think i'm about up to 20 some odd pieces or so um not counting the tractor and those things that i made early on um because they're they're really nothing like the art that i'm making now uh, i do have a piece with me here which is a little hard to show on video, but this uh, is yeah. a little dragon that I made. This is one of the first ones that I added lighting to, but you can see that little intricacies, little steam whistle on top, little thread coming from that steam whistle that's made out of cardboard as well. And so, yeah, I make these wow, little tiny wow, things. Wow. So this is about uh, three inches tall in total with all the details that go into it. Okay, so for those who are listening in, um, we will post a picture online as well of what Charlie is showing us. But every detail is, I'm just trying to wrap my head around this, Charlie, because for me, I'm not great with gripping on my fingers. That's something that like, so doing this little, the small details is just mind blowing to me how you piece together all those little details to form it like that. I mean, yeah. these details are so intricate and small and so just on point. Yeah, and this, is, this is a triceratops that I just barely started. And yeah, the, I have pretty steady hands mm -hmm. and I've learned a few tricks as I've been going about it where I like will hold, I, I use a scalpel and so I, I will hold the scalpel and then I'll like take one finger from my other hand and put it against it, which helps steady it as I'm cutting so I can get really straight lines and, and things like that. And so I've, I'm also very nearsighted. And so I just take my glasses off and I can see really up close and, and do well. And then I do use little tiny, tiny tools. So I'm using like a really sharp awl and a scalpel most of the time for everything that I do. And so I actually apply glue with this tiny, tiny awl. And then I use the scalpel to cut, to pick things up with as well. I will like do a little stab and pick up like a shingle that's going on a roof that's literally an inch long. Like the roof is an inch long. So the shingle is millimeters and or even smaller. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's my craziness. I'm, I'm still just awestruck. <laughs> Do you listen to music when you create? Like I'm seeing a visual here, so I have I to. I do. Ask, I do. I music? 
I listen to a lot of different music. Sometimes I'll put a like a show on Netflix or something in the background that I've seen before, so I don't have to pay a ton of attention to it. It's just like there. Um, but uh, I listen to a lot of music. Um, I have a couple of Pandora stations that are uh, like revolve around some of my favorite artists, like uh, um, Anne Berlin, uh, Death Cab for Cutie, Meg Myers, um, some some of those. <laughs> How do you go about the process, Charlie? Do you sketch it out first and then go, or do you have it just in your mind and you know exactly where you're going and you just start piecing things together as you see it? I sometimes do like a really rough sketch, mm -hmm. um, just kind of an idea. And then I um, work with a container. So I usually have a container in mind like this is one that I recently got for another fairy house that I'll put in this. And so, so I am working within those dimensions. And so then I know, okay, the fairy house can't be this tall. It has to be exactly this tall. And then I will start cutting and then it's almost, um, it's a little bit like working with clay in a way because I'm I'm adding and sub subtracting. So I'll cut a piece and then I'll put it on. And if I don't like it, I'll pull it off before the glue sets <laughs> and cut a new piece and add it. And I'm slowly adding and subtracting until I get what I want out of it. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time I'm pretty happy um, early on. And so that's rare that I'm I'm like, okay, I have to completely redo this thing. Um, but every once in a while, I'll, I'll do something and and have to rework it and figure out. Uh, had to cut a tail off a dragon because it wasn't looking right and reattach it. And um, but paper cardboard is actually very forgiving in a lot of ways, and it doesn't take a lot of uh, material. I'm gonna sneak over here and grab. A piece. So this is what I'm working with. It's a box board. You can see I've got glue all over. But uh, but usually a piece like this size will do an entire uh, sculpture. So this whole thing wow. comes out of this. Wow. And usually I've got plenty left over that I will use for other pieces. And so it, it doesn't take a lot of material. It really is just a lot of fiddly little work. Uh, sometimes I'm cutting partway through this and peeling out pieces when I want thinner pieces. And sometimes I'm cutting all the way through when I want some good support structure. So like you can see um, this little hole here <laughs> is actually the body of my dragon. And so so I have the, the body right there and then I curl it and twist it. So it's kind of crazy that this comes out of that, that flat form, but mm -hmm. I took that and I twisted it around to get what I wanted out of it. And so it's it just, is just a interesting art form that I picked up. That's really cool to see that visual too, Charlie, of like with the cardboard, because like mentally I'm looking at that piece that you're showing to me and my brain's like, wait, how does it do that? Like, how did you get that piece to form into the creation of the dragon? That's pretty fascinating. Yeah. So I'll do an, an inside form and then I'll curl that around into the shape that I want it mm -hmm. and then set it with glue. And then I start wrapping that body in little strips of cardboard that I glue together. And then I start adding the little detail work and doing little rivets and yeah, it's, yeah. it's time consuming, but it's very meditative. That's one reason like I'll, I will, I will put something on in the background music or a TV show and I will forget that anything is actually playing 
I'll stop listening to the music. I just kind of fall into what I'm doing little pieces at a time. And it's rare that something upsets me. Like every once in a while I'll be working on a piece and I did have uh, a little door that I cut. Um, that was, the door was literally like that tall. <laughs> and I cut a little speakeasy out of it. So this little tiny, <laughs> like top of head of a pin speakeasy. And then as I was applying the door, my scalpel hit the edge of it and it flipped over my shoulder and landed in the carpet and I never found it. And so the, <laughs> the finished fairy house did not have a speakeasy in the door because I was not cutting that out again. It took, <laughs> took me like half an hour just to do the speakeasy. And I was like, nope, not going to do that again. And so, yeah, I, I, don't really get upset and just kind of meditate and do it. And and if something doesn't work out, then I'm like, okay, it wasn't meant to be. No, it did no not speakeasy. want to be found. Your speakeasy. It did no. not. No. no. <laughs> it ended up in the, the vacuum cleaner somewhere at some point. <laughs> it's got a new journey now. <laughs> <laughs> How long typically, I know art is a very different essence of time depending on what you're creating typically how long do you think it takes you to build a cardboard creation uh, most of them are about uh, 10 to 20 hours now when i first started they were about 40 hours and i've gotten better at doing it faster but also editing myself uh, i have a velociraptor that i created early on and that thing is so detailed and there are so many details that most people will never even notice because i was doing things like in the underside of the belly of it and um little gears and stuff that are poking through the the seams and like i did so much extra work that most people won't appreciate but i i like that it's there and i've learned to still do some of that but edit myself a little bit and say okay I can do a gear here and a gear here and get the same effect as if I were to do 20 little gears hidden all throughout the body. And, and so I've, I've learned to scale back a little bit and go faster. So, mm -hmm. which, which helps me sell them because then they're less expensive too, because early on I was like, okay, I spent 40 hours on this and it's this big. Will people actually pay what it's worth now that with the hours that I put into it? And it was surprising. I, I took quite a few to like Comic-Con and things like that. And um, I would tell people the price and they would whistle and step back and mm -hmm. then say, worth every penny, I just can't afford it. Like nobody was like shocked by the price, only that they couldn't drop that kind of change. <laughs> right. But everybody was like, no, that's totally, totally worth it. But yeah. What do you think personally has been the hardest part in your journey about being an artist and a creator? Um, I am an introvert and I have social anxiety. And so I have a hard time pushing and getting myself out there. So I have a hard time um, doing self-advertising. I have a hard time getting into galleries and talking to the the people there and pushing like advocating for myself as an artist uh, I, I really really wish i had somebody who did all that for me but i'm not there yet so i have to do it myself and so that is that is the hardest part for me is just being pushy and uh, confident and sure of myself and advocating for myself because mm -hmm. that's really hard for an introvert to do a hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> like you have good ideas, but it's different taking the action into the yep. ideas for sure. Like, make this beautiful thing. And then we're like, I made this thing. If you want, maybe look at it. <laughs> but be nice. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're very, uh, 
thin skinned in a lot of ways too. And like, it's like, we take criticism really hard if people don't like what we've made and like, and, and seriously talking to a gallery owner is the most exhausting thing. Yeah. <laughs> What's one of your favorite things about the process of creating? I, I think it's always just been a part of who I am. Like I, I seriously remember the first time I created art and my mom was a, a bit of an artist. She would uh, paint with acrylics and she um, would, for a while there, she was picking up saw blades and she was painting scenes on saw blades and selling them. And I remember her doing a little class for our church and um, she had no place to put me. And so I was sitting in the back and she handed me some crayons and I remember her like she was making this painting and I sat and I made the painting with my crayons. And when she came back, she was shocked that I had put together exactly what she'd done with acrylics, but I'd done it with crayons. And, and she immediately put me in some classes. And um, once again, I always did okay. And I loved art and I was driven to make art. Mm but I wasn't great at it. I was good. I wasn't great. And to be an artist who actually like makes a dent, you have to be great. And, and so I, I kept trying and I kept trying new things and I was driven to do it. And I got into writing and I was driven to do that because I like, I love telling stories, whether it's visually or in the written word and so mm -hmm. i think that's what drives me is i i'm a storyteller and i love telling stories and making stories and creating interesting variations on what reality could be and i can't help but do that and so it just comes out whether it's in art or or in my writing mm -hmm. you mentioned that you love dinosaurs <laughs> when you were a little boy is a velociraptor because i know you have a fantastic impersonation so i'm curious is that your favorite dinosaur it actually isn't okay. uh, <laughs> my favorite my favorite is uh um triceratops and i i fell in love with triceratopses before land before time came out and yeah <laughs> like i i actually have this weird thing where i wrote a short story in elementary school about a dinosaur that has to move across the country and leave all his friends behind. And it was a triceratops that traveled across the country and went through all these hardships and then made new friends along the way and, and came to a, a new place. And then Land Before Time came out and I was like, did my elementary school teacher write this or something? Because this is my story. <laughs> and um, just with Littlefoot, the brontosaurus even though they're not called brontosauruses now but uh uh yeah like the long neck as the main character instead of the triceratops and i'm like this is my story just slightly shifted um but no my elementary school teacher did not write it i i looked into it so it's just <laughs> one of those coincidences where i wrote land before time before land before time um velociraptor actually came about because i had a friend who did like had watched the movies a billion times and he did a velociraptor impersonation and I thought it was pretty good. But as he was doing it, I was like, I could probably make it a little, little better. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I'm, I'm like that. I'd like, like watch people do something and I'm like, huh, I could tweak it and do it this way and, and maybe make it a little bit better. And, uh, and, I also did some animal noises before then, like I could do a goat and um, a turkey and a couple of other things that just to entertain my nieces and nephews and, and such. But he did this velociraptor and, and so I picked it up and started doing it too. And I became kind of well known for doing it. So I do it at conferences like 20 some odd times. And 
it's one of those things that it's funny because it's the loudest that you will ever hear me as an introvert. I can manage to do this Velociraptor thing because I'm just doing this little short. Um, but it's also a great icebreaker as a introvert. Like if I'm doing a panel or a presentation or something like that, like that, it uh, breaks the ice really well, and everybody laughs and calms down and loses all their anxiety about the the panel. And you can you can feel the audience just relax after I do the Velociraptor. And I do the same thing where I kind of, I get out some of that nervous energy and then I can do my panel or my presentation without as much stress. I love how you mentioned that because I've had the opportunity to hear your impersonation a few times. My daughter got to hear it uh, right before COVID hit and she has social anxiety. And that's actually exactly what she told me after she heard your impersonation. She's like, wow, I actually feel really relaxed now. That was fun. So <laughs> it does have that energy. For sure. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us, Charlie, this impersonation of the Velociraptor? Sure. It will okay. be a little, a little interesting <laughs> to do with... <laughs> with the camera, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. Boxed impersonation. So now I have to adjust a little bit. <laughs> Unplug this. Okay. You should, you should still be able to hear, hear me a little bit. Okay. Move the chair. <laughs> I think, I don't know if it was for me, it's always great, but I knew what was going to happen, but it's still like, I, st I knew what was going to happen, but it still gets you every time. It's fantastic. Thanks, Charlie. You're <laughs> It's definitely better in person. <laughs> the whole like the easing up to it too, the suspense is for real in your impersonation. <laughs> the the best experience I had with it, um, I asked for volunteers at a panel and somebody volunteered and he stood in the middle of the aisle and I came off the stage and started doing it and he like was smiling as i was doing the the, the build up and then as soon as i started running and screeching his face like all the <laughs> color went out of his face and and his eyes got big and he immediately turned and tried to get away from me and tripped over his own feet and like fell and slid in the middle of the aisle <laughs> And I felt so bad because I was like, I, I never want somebody to like get that scared and hurt themselves. Oh. And I was I like really quick, gave him a little pin that I hand out to people that I, I do it to um, that says I, I got raptored by Charlie Pulsifer. And, <laughs> and then I had to come find him after and be like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean because like me as a introvert with social anxiety, I also would have been mortified that I fell in front of all these people. Um, and he was like, no, it was the best part of the conference for me. And I'm like, I'm so glad that you feel that way, even though I scared you enough that you fell over and slid in the middle of the aisle. Uh, yeah, but it was, it was, it's fun to talk about now. <laughs> if you go to conferences, find Charlie for the full experience, <laughs> for the full visual virtual experience. <laughs> I, I have also had a couple of people get mad at me because I, I don't always give people warning. And so I did, I did it once and, and somebody around the corner was like feeding their baby. And I was like, I didn't know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I scared your baby so bad that, yeah. So I have to be a little careful. <laughs> what would
would you say, Charlie, is the most mysterious place that you've explored that's inspired the most creativity for you? Hmm. I think the redwoods are up there. Hmm. The um, saw my trip and parked on the side of the road at a little trail that takes you back to see one of the biggest ones. And I went back and there was a group of people taking pictures. And so I was like, oh, I'm just going to go on the trail a little farther. And it was literally like two minutes further on and I couldn't hear another soul. And I was completely by myself, surrounded by these just massive trees and they creak in the wind. So I'm just sitting there listening to these old trees almost talk to one another and just creaking back and forth a little bit. And um, it it was surreal and beautiful. And there's all this moss and stuff underneath your feet. And it's so quiet. Like, wildlife, nothing else going on, couldn't hear any people, it's just me and the trees talking. And I think that was, that was special. Mm. I love trees. They're one of my favorite things. I'm just filling into the beautiful imagery of what that felt like in that moment. Yeah. And it's interesting because I, I wrote the Crystal Bridge before visiting the Redwoods, but the, um, which is, surprising because I, I talk a lot about like I have tree elves and and they have a special connection with trees and they have kind of these moments with their trees and I, it's like I got to have that moment after I wrote the book to sit amongst the trees and listen to them talk. Mm -hmm. We're going to take it to the inner child question segment. Are you ready, Charlie? I don't know. <laughs> Can I say no? <laughs> My inner child just like <laughs> ran and hid in a bush in the corner. <laughs> All right. Charlie's inner child. First question. As a teenager, what was a phrase that you used the most often? I think I said something along the lines of um it's okay to be weird or it's cool to be weird it's kind of when i first started to embrace that i was a little bit different and that that was okay and that it was good to be uh, a little weird i had a, a t-shirt that had like all these figures in gray and then a figure in the middle that was purple and dancing and it and it said something along those lines of like, it's it's cool to be weird. And so I referenced that t-shirt a lot and pointed to it a lot when people would be like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, as I'm making hey, weird, hey. weird animal noises and, <laughs> and really into my drippy ink drawings that I was doing at the time. And yeah, I I kind of was a champion of the weird in high school. I love it. My my weird sees your weird and it's fantastic. <laughs> Thank you for being you. <laughs> when you were a kid, what was your favorite fantastical creature? I was obsessed with dinosaurs and dragons. Mm -hmm. I really was. Like from an early age, I, I got into dinosaurs and I knew like all the species and all this nerdy facts about them and that kind of brought me into dragons i uh read a book when i was about eight that was about uh a knight that kills a dragon and gets a heart stone from it and i became obsessed with dragons and i started drawing them a lot and so i loved dinosaurs and dragons we have a few comments coming in that I'm going to pop up. Oh, I forgot that there's people actually watching. <laughs> James. Oh, Hi, James. James. for joining us today. Hey, James says, Miss Hi. him in 
Serene, Charlie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Serene, so glad to have you both here today. Redwoods are still on my bucket list. Yes. I recommend it. You. Redwoods, Niagara, Yellowstone are all places people should go in their lifetime. Mm -hmm. I went when I was 14, but I don't remember anything. So I need to go back again. <laughs> To like yeah, I was that. I was like five or six when I like visited most of these places before. My mm -hmm. family did road trips, and I don't remember much of any of them. And so, I wanted to go back to all these places that I should remember but didn't. And now I have very good, vivid memories of them. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us, guys. So good to see both of you here today. Third question. This is one of my favorites. What's the oddest food combo that you've liked and tried, or you've just tried? <laughs> tried lots of food. I, I grew up in Louisiana, and so I've had lots of interesting food combos that people in the West don't necessarily get. I make jambalaya regularly. Mm -hmm. um, mm. Mm -hmm. uh, I lived in um, New England for a while. I've tried fluffernutter. That's an interesting combo. What um, is that? I don't know what that is. Uh, they make sandwiches with peanut butter and marshmallow fluff, marshmallow cream. Uh, it's called a fluffernutter sandwich. And it surprisingly good so not healthy but but surprisingly good and i've had like uh grilled ones and it, it's really good but really not not healthy it's like a dessert oh my gosh i'm seeing this so the grilled so like it's melting and the combo oh my gosh that sounds amazing mm -hmm. it is it's it's pretty good uh i've uh what else? I had a um, like breakfast once where somebody served orange juice with basil in it. And I was like, that's weird. And then I tried it and it was like one of the best things ever. Okay. Was, so I'm visually, was it literally like basil? Like, so it's chopped. So it's got the the stems in the orange juice so we get like the it was, visual here it was, it was a couple of leaves and then they yeah. muddled it in the in the orange juice and i've never it, heard of that either yeah like i've i've seen people put like mint and <laughs> but basil it, it was surprising really good um i don't like watermelon at all like something about the texture but Somebody gave me a uh, watermelon juice with lime in it once. And Ooh. it's seriously one of my favorite things. Like mm -hmm. I really don't like watermelon, but for some reason, watermelon with lime, it was perfect. And, and I loved it. Um, I've tried, I work um, with my marketing stuff. I work for some Japanese co companies. And so I've tried some interesting things from Japan, like uh, squid jerky and um they have this one snack mix that is anchovies and almonds like almond slices and it's like crunchy like is a, it blended together charlie they're they're not blended together but they're in the same bag like a trail mix of dried anchovies and almonds i did not like it no. but, <laughs> but i'm not a fish person so a lot of their their combos aren't great, um, but, and then if anybody has ever had a, an elote, the Mexican street corn. Ooh, you're speaking my language. I love corn. I love yeah. corn. That's one of my favorite things ever. Oh, um, I lived in Mexico for a while too. And um, I did not love a lot of their food. Like I, I love Mexican food, but when you're actually living in Mexico, you're eating things that like aren't necessarily things you're used to eating, like pickled pig skin and yeah. 
um, <laughs> things like that. And so I was a little nervous trying new things all the time. And somebody was like, you want an elote? And I was like, I don't know what that is. I don't want it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, we're buying you one. And they, they bought me an elote. And I think I ate like 20 elotes that week after they bought me one because they are so good. They like grill the corn over fire and then um, roll it in Mexican cream and then in uh, chili lime salt. Oh my goodness. And sprinkle a little bit of like um, Mexican cotija cheese on it. And it's the best thing. And I, uh, I don't want one of those things too, where I don't love corn on the cob. I've never loved corn on the cob. It's very bland to me to yeah. have just like corn and butter, but this was just amazing. A little bit spicy, good and salty, low acid heat going on. Yeah, it was, it was perfect. So elotes, people need to try elotes. Okay, everyone. So I have three new recipes. The corn for sure, because the whole idea with the spice, fun corn. I love corn. Um, I'm going to try the orange juice and the basil and also that delicious sandwich with peanut butter and marshmallow. If anyone wants to have a breakfast with me and you could just show me your meal and I'll show you mine. Thanks, Charlie. You're welcome. <laughs> some really great and some, yeah, I'm with you on the anchovy and almonds. I just, I'm not a fishy person. That just, I will try it just to see, but that just doesn't sound appetizing. Yeah, I was I was surprised by, like, they do some uh, tempura seaweed chips. Mm -hmm. And seaweed's a little fishy, but I was surprised to actually love those. Yeah. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. Are they, like, chips where they packaged like a chip or? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we have some good, odd, <laughs> and delicious. You gave us lots of beautiful blends of different things. Before we end today, Charlie, what is some advice that you can give our listeners and viewers on what living a creatively abundant life means to you? I think it means like never giving up on your creativity. Uh, there are times in your life where you're, you're less creative and that's okay. I've gone through some, some highs and lows where I've burnt myself out creatively. Um, I've, uh, I have done some, uh, ghostwriting where I wrote, uh, like five books for other people in like two years and it was a lot and I got a little burnt out and I had to step back from creativity for a little while and that's okay to let your, your cup recharge, but that doesn't mean you're, you're stopping. Just keep, mm -hmm keep going. Also, um, keep exploring until you find what clicks. Like I would have never expected when I was a teenager trying to draw my dragons with pen and ink that, that eventually I'd be making them out of cardboard and they would actually sell and I'd be in galleries and, and things like that. Um, I don't think I would have believed myself if I'd gone back in time and told myself that's where you're going to be. Though I kind of wish I had, because I wish I'd picked up cardboard earlier. But uh, but yeah, keep exploring, keep trying new things until something clicks. Eventually, something will click, and then and then perfect that. Like whatever clicks, perfect it. Keep working at it. Um, art is a skill that you improve with practice. So keep working at it. It's not something that a lot of people think you're you have innate talents and of course you do but but a person with zero talent who works at it every day can reach the point of a master who was born with talent so you just keep working at it thank you so much for being with us today charlie you are such a joy to spend time with where can they find you if they have any questions about your books and want to see the amazing creations that you are working on? Um, people can find me on uh, Facebook and Instagram pretty easily. Just type in Charlie Pulsifer and I come up. 
Um, my books are on Amazon. My art is, I, I share a lot of it on Instagram. And also uh, it's in, I have several pieces in a gallery in St. George. So if you're ever in St. George, Utah, um, there's a, a gallery. Why am I blinking on the name of the gallery? <laughs> oh, art, look up art provides. Um, it's in the top floor of an old movie theater on Main Street in St. George. And so it's That's a beautiful fun. space, it's a cool mm -hmm. gallery. A uh, little hard to find. People go in, and there's a couple galleries galleries on the main floor, and people will explore those and then walk out, and they don't even realize that upstairs is a treasure trove of cool art as well. And I'm one of those treasure troves <laughs> <laughs> hidden up there. And um, I have, uh, I think, about 10 pieces there, maybe 11. There's one embedded in a, a wall on the stairs that you go up that's just, it's literally this big. It's a little tiny uh, fairy home in a vial and it's embedded in the wall. A lot of people miss it. And then I have quite a few pieces there. Thank you, thank you. Check out Charlie Pulsifer. We will put all the links down below so it's easy access to find him. And as you go about the rest of your week, remember to find the things that are working within your life. You are the creator of your own story. Find what lights up your heart and whispers within your mind. And we will see you at this time, 12 o'clock p.m. Mountain Standard Time, next Monday with Tom Kai's author of Whisper Room. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Charlie, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Have a wonderful week. You too.